Hello again, and welcome back to another podcast from the Journal of Oncology Practice. This is Dr. Bob Miller from Johns Hopkins. Well, today we're going to be addressing the topic of hepatitis B virus screening for patients who are about to begin chemotherapy or other immunosuppressive therapy. There was a manuscript in the July Journal of Oncology Practice from a group at MD Anderson, low rates of hepatitis B virus screening at the onset of chemotherapy. I'm pleased to have the lead author of the manuscript as my guest for this podcast, back for a repeat performance. Dr. Jessica Wong is an internal medicine physician and health services researcher in the Department of General Internal Medicine at at MD Anderson. Her primary interest is in prevention and management of toxic effects of cancer therapy, specifically reactivation of hepatitis B virus infection in patients after chemotherapy. So welcome back, Jessica. How how did you get on the podcast twice in the last six months? You you must know somebody here, I guess. (laughs) Well, thank you, Bob, for the, the repeat invitation. I'm really delighted to be here again. Thank you. It's a great topic. We're glad to your insights. So, so let's let's start with the real basic stuff. So, second year medical school stuff. What, t- tell me a little bit about basic hepatitis B serology. What what do you need to know to understand this topic? Certainly, there are multiple hepatitis B tests, but for screening purposes, it's important to remember that there are three tests. One is an antigen, and two are antibody tests. First, the hepatitis B surface antigen. It's um, Uh, abbreviated by HBSAG. Um, That's our first one. Our second one is the hepatitis B core antibody, also known as anti-HBC. And the third is a hepatitis B surface antibody, anti-HBS. I'd like to give you some scenarios for these tests. Sure. Um, For our audience, uh, they would probably be interested in patients who have chronic hepatitis B infection and that's where patients would have both hepatitis B surface antigen and core antibody tests that were positive. Also, patients who have had previous infection but are now immune, they would have core antibody and surface antibody tests that were positive. Interestingly, there are patients with occult hepatitis B infection, and that's where their surface antigen is negative and their core antibody is positive. And, of course, patients who have had previous infection, their anti-HBS would be the only test that's positive. I think it's important to remember that all three tests are are necessary to accurately and completely diagnose a patient's hepatitis B status. Okay, got it. So why is this an important topic for oncologists? And and, and what was your group interested in when when you did this analysis? We were interested to see uh, what the screening rates were because if we can identify patients with cancer and hepatitis B and get them to um, very effective oral antiviral therapy, we can reduce their risk of reactivation of hepatitis B. Reactivation can happen um, in patients with chronic infection or occult infection and even in patients with previously, who have been previously infected and are now immune. So reactivation can look like a a transient elevated um, ALT or an AST, could lead to ascites or jaundice, can cause delays in care, namely there's chemotherapy, and it can also cause fulminant liver um, failure and even death. So obviously the risk of morbidity and even mortality is not negligible for an infected patient, so I I guess that's why we need to know this. Correct. In, in patients with um, chronic hepatitis B infection, up to 50% of these patients will reactivate after chemotherapy. Tell me about your study. What did you, what did you look at and what were your major findings? Yeah, we looked at our institutional databases at MD Anderson and we wanted to examine the rates as well as the predictors of hepatitis B screening. And our study covers the years of 2004 to 2007. Um, We merged uh, patient data using our tumor registry, our pharmacy informatics, our lab informatics, and our patient accounts database. We had over 70,000 new patients during our study period, and over 10,000 had chemotherapy. And of the patients who had chemotherapy, we found that approximately 17% were screened for hepatitis B, And interestingly, among patients with risk factors for hepatitis B infection, 
only one in five patients were screened. The time that the study took place during those years, did your institution have any standard guidelines that everyone was supposed to follow about screening? No, during our study period, we had no official uh, policy regarding hepatitis B screening. And in fact, even today, we have no official written policy. Uh, there are some centers, uh, mostly hematologic malignancy centers, who make it their standard and routine practice, although there are no automated systems and there's no official written policy in, in their centers either. Tell me a little more about your findings in terms of predictors, like who who was more likely to be positive for chronic infection or, or at the greatest risk of reactivation, I guess, is the main issue. Right. So um, we... We performed a multivariable logistic regression analysis on, um, on on who would have a positive hepatitis B screening test. And we found that um, male patients were um, had higher odds of having a positive screening test. Uh, when we looked at ethnicity, patients who had uh, declared themselves as being of Asian um, ethnicity and race or black ethnicity and race uh, were more, uh, were, had higher odds of having a positive uh, hepatitis B test. In addition, patients who had at least one hepatitis B risk factor had higher odds of a positive test. As expected, patients with primary liver cancer had higher odds of having positive hepatitis B tests. Did you find out uh, what clinical circumstances physicians were more likely to recommend and perform screening? Were there certain disease types that were more likely to be screened versus others? Yes, we, we found higher rates of screening among patients with, who had hematologic malignancies. Uh, and in addition, patients who were expected to have rituximab therapy were screened at high rates as well. But I gather that this risk of reactivation is not restricted to rituximab. I think we all kind of have that uh, knowledge. But the, the risk of reactivation from chronic infection, is, is that something that can occur with virtually any chemotherapy? Is that, is that correct? I think so. There are no large-scale population um, studies that have been performed in the U.S. Most of the literature and, um, and previous studies have been performed in high-prevalence areas, say, in, in Asia, but there are, are other types of chemotherapy that have been associated with reactivation. Um, in addition, there is a gluco, uh, there are studies that show that uh, steroids um, are an independent risk factor for reactivation as well. And clearly, there is an effective prophylaxis. There, there, if, if this is identified, then some of these more serious complications can be meaningfully prevented or eliminated. Absolutely. There are at least five oral antiviral medications that can prevent reactivation. Entecavir, tenofovir, telbivudine, adesivir, and lamivudine. Interferon has been uh, used for patients with hepatitis B, but they're not re recommended for our cancer patients with hepatitis B because of the bone marrow suppression. Okay. So let's talk about some of the official guidelines from other organizations. The CDC issued some guidelines, I believe that was in 2008 or so, and ASCO issued a provisional clinical opinion. And, and I gather there's some uh, important differences between those two. Can, can you highlight that? Yes. The CDC guidelines recommend to screen all patients before any type of immunosuppression to prevent their risk of reactivation. The ASCO provisional clinical opinion recommends hepatitis B screening among patients with risk factors for hepatitis B and patients prior to highly immunosuppressive therapies such as rituximab and stem cell transplantation. I think that um, we really just need better evidence to support whether risk-based or universal screening is superior and which one is more cost-effective. But I gather that's probably going to be a challenge to get those kind of data. I think this is going to take um, some time, uh, collaboration, but we are, we are hoping to um, start this kind of a project here at MD Anderson. So the other thing I was going to ask you was uh, you had this interesting finding, at least interesting to me, that um, there were a significant number of patients positive for um, anti-HBC but were negative for surface antigen. So can you explain what, how does that happen? What, what are the cir clinical circumstances where that finding might be identified? These patients um, 
probably represent patients who have uh, been previously infected and are now immune, although we would need their anti-HBS testing results to be certain. And unfortunately, during our time period, many of those patients did not have this testing done. We found uh, of the patients who had hepatitis B testing, uh, approximately 7.5% of the patients indeed had positive um, anti-HBC, yet, yet negative HBSAG. And this is something that we had anticipated uh, in our extrapolation of population-based data. Um, this is what we would see in our general population. Um, this could also represent uh, some patients who have had occult disease as well. But I think the main message is that um, whether you have an anti-HBC that's positive or an an HBSAG that's positive, these patients have risk of reactivation and uh, they need to be monitored. Uh, they will probably benefit um, from antiviral therapy and they really need close follow-up during and after chemotherapy. So I think that's an important point. So I think it sounds like what you're saying is that whether it's the anti-HBC that's, that the diagnosis is made with or the surface antigen, it, both are important. Absolutely. Okay. What about any kind of screening discussion, always the issue of cost effectiveness is integral to it. So uh, I don't know if you collected these data in, in, in your study, but do you have any sense of how, how cost effective is this type of screening? Like, has anyone done any kind of modeling studies uh, looking at the different screening strategies? Yes. They, in, uh, in the last year, there have been two uh, very nice articles in uh, JCO, uh, an Australian study by day in uh, 2011, uh, studied uh, universal screening versus no screening for two solid tumor types, um, adjuvant breast cancer and palliative uh, non-small cell lung CA. Uh, the authors found that universal screening was not cost effective, but did find that HBSAG testing up for the patients with breast cancer who are undergoing adjuvant chemotherapy was cost effective. Uh, there was a recent article in JCO in June um, published by Zorowski, a, a Canadian study, uh, studying lymphoma patients receiving RCHOP. Uh, and they, the authors studied um, universal versus high risk, namely birthplace in a highly prevalent area, versus no screening. Uh, and they found that universal screening was the most cost effective. Now, we haven't done this kind of study at MD Anderson, but we are very interested in doing this, and I think the future study should really focus on um, a widespread uh, look at uh, various types of solid tumors, um, other risk factors uh, besides, uh, but still including the important one of birthplace and other types of chemotherapy. So I, I guess the question is, un until these data are available, if, if if they ever are available, because again, it sounds like it's one of those areas that's just tough to study with the prevalence not being that high. Um, what recommendations would you give to oncologists faced with this question to screen or not to screen? What, what, what would your recommendations be based on, based on your work and your study here? Right. I really think that we need really good evidence to make strong recommendations, but until that evidence is available, I would recommend screening patients who have risk factors for hepatitis B. But that would mean that oncologists would really need to uh, ask about a patient's hepatitis B risk factor, namely where they were born and to establish whether those areas were in moderate to high prevalence areas. Um, if the patient had been born in the U.S. but not vaccinated, and if so, were their parents born in areas of high prevalence? Um, if the patient had household or sexual contacts um, of a patient who had an HBSAG that was positive, a history of drug abuse, multiple sex partners, or a history of sexually transmitted disease, ever been imprisoned, chronically elevated liver function tests, a history of hepatitis C or HIV, and, you know, this is a very long list. Sure. So if we don't go through that whole list, then I would say you might want to screen your patient. Uh, and I think it's important to realize that even if we went through all of the risk factors, the antenatal studies of hepatitis B screening had showed in previously in England that if we had screened everybody based on risk factors alone, we would miss probably half the patients who actually had hepatitis B. Wow, that's that's pretty sobering. <laughs> <laughs> but really, you know, the sensitivity and the specificity of these hepatitis B tests are excellent. And um, 
our institution, as well as many, follow F the FDA guidelines and, and report uh, tests that are positive only after they've been checked twice. So if we're going to screen, these are really excellent tests to, to screen with. As you were going through that list of clinical conditions, I was I was thinking the the longer the list, the com I can just see the compliance rate plummeting. As, <laughs> as uh, you know, you, you expect you're going to ask all those questions in the social yeah. history, the past medical history. So, right. I mean, I think I think oncologists are very busy, and if we don't go through the list, then we might want to consider other ways of screening. So the the bottom line here, Bob, is that until we have better evidence. We should at least screen patients who have risk factors for hepatitis B. And we have to know what the risk factors are. Dr. Wong, thank you very much for sharing this very provocative information with us. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure talking with you today. And that'll do it for this podcast. You can read the entire paper online at jop.ascopubs.org. And just as a reminder, this paper is available only online and not in the print issue. We'll be back next month with another podcast from the July issue. This is Dr. Bob Miller for the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Thanks very much for your attention.